Hey, what's up? This is Seth Mosley, and you're listening to the Full Circle Music Show, the why of the music biz. Today we have in studio Brad Rempel of the band High Valley. He's the front man, singer, songwriter, and one of the two faces of the band. Him and his brother are High Valley together. But they have signed to Warner Nashville and are out touring like crazy. Their lead single off the new record, Make You Mine, is tearing up the country charts. And to a lot of people in the States, and really a lot of the world, this is a brand new band. This is their first American single. These are some of the first times different crowds are being exposed to them. But today, you're going to hear the real backstory. You're going to hear a lot longer of a journey than that. When they go into a record label in Nashville and the marketing crew says things like, well, this is just, you know, you guys have blown up overnight and it's happened so fast. Brad can kind of just quietly smile and nod and laugh a little bit, knowing that he's been doing it since he's four years old. And a lot of artists will never be willing to put in the work that they have put in to get to where they are. So today is really just kind of a story of perseverance. It's a story of how you have to be obsessed with something in order to succeed at it. You can't just like it. You can't even just love it. You have to be obsessed with it. So you're going to learn a lot from this episode. But before we dive in, I just had a quick announcement for you about our music production mastery course. Hi, I'm looking for the next big music producers I can add to our Grammy winning team. And I've created a course to help you 10x your music productions instantly. Music Production Mastery. I show you how we do things like programming, drum, bass, and guitar production, getting pro vocals, editing, post-production, mixing, Logic Pro, and Pro Tools. Who can I help? One, music makers who are driven and passionate. Two, beginners and experts. You don't need tons of experience, but you at least have to be teachable. Three, you must be making great music or at least aspiring to. That's all. So why would I be giving away my secrets? Well, first, I love to teach. Secondly, I am actively looking for talent. Take a moment to enroll in the course and you'll be on your way to better sounding music productions right away. For more info on that course, text PRODUCE, that's P-R-O-D-U-C-E, to 44222. Text PRODUCE, P-R-O-D-U-C-E, to 44222, and we'll send you information on it. So let's jump into the studio with Brad Rempel. All right, we're here on the Full Circle Music Show. We've got Brad Rempel from High Valley with us in the studio. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing great, splendid. How are you? Good. Just had some veggie tacos and some chips and salsa. And some chicken fajitas, I might add. It's only the 700th time, I believe, that we've ate at Oscars. So yeah. It's good. Oscars Taco Shop has pretty much kept us alive during <laughs> the course of our relationship. Together. You were going to say they funded the record until you yeah. realized that they deleted all the funds they from the record. The funds <laughs> <from> the record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Well, man, we've known each other for a long time, so I'm interested because a lot of the people we've had on the show, you know, I have some kind of a relationship with, but it's interesting. I learned something new. We were just yeah. talking about this. Ben yeah. Stennis was on last show, and I learned new things about him just yeah. in having that conversation. And we've written a dozen, dozen of songs together. Yeah, you and Ben and myself has been like the trio that's wrote most of everything that people have heard of High Valley, and you can definitely learn something new about Ben every single time you hang out with him. Very true. (laughs) I enjoyed the podcast, by the way. That was great. I listened to it. Oh, awesome. So for listeners out there, go back to episode, I think it was 36, was Ben Stennis. Check that out. But yeah, I just wanted to go all the way back to the beginning. I mean, tell us the story. I know High Valley has been a thing for a lot longer than most people realize. Yeah, sometimes by design, we don't actually like to admit to people how long High Valley has existed because there's, what would be the right word? There's like a perception in the music industry that if you tell people you've been going for too long, they say, oh, well, you must suck because I haven't heard of you until yeah. this year. I honestly think the opposite is true. I think you can learn a lot through failures over a long period of time. I can honestly say that High Valley started 20 years ago, and I don't remember one year ever feeling like this year is worse than last year. Yeah. I know that sounds maybe 
Hard to believe, but I remember in 1999, we really thought things were looking a lot better than what they were looking in, you know, the year before. So yeah. when we recorded our first record in this town called Berwyn, Alberta, and no word of a lie, in the two days that we were there, we cut all the music and all the vocals and had it mixed in two days. <laughs> you can imagine how great that was. Impressive. And we saw zero moving cars in the town in the two days we were there. That gives you an idea of how big the town was and how active it was. But we're from practically the North Pole, so we were already in a bigger town than what we grew up in. And that's kind of when we started just making really low budget records, you know, in the 90s, the early 2000s. And it wasn't until 2009 that we had our first record that ever got played on radio. And at that point in time, it was uh, Canada through Universal Music. And that's when we kind of started, you know, cranking things up a few notches. So a lot of people would look at our band as being about seven years old. Mm. So your story, I mean, it's a family band, right? Yeah. It's my brother Curtis and I, and over the years there's been various people in the band, but for a long time it was three brothers. And we started, I mean, we got three older sisters, and they are, we like to refer to them as the Harmony Nazis, because they were like <laughs> so in love with Harmony that they would like rehearse it until everybody's ears are bleeding and they're way pickier than me. I'm very not detail oriented. So I can't think about the same harmony for a long time. You know this about me. Every time I hear a demo or any song, I get lost within like 10 seconds in how will the crowd respond? How will this go over at radio? Will people want to buy this song? Will they want to sing along? My sisters could pick one line in a song and just analyze the harmony until it was perfect and their three older sisters mom and dad had three girls first and then three boys and the three girls can sing a lot better than the boys can and they practice a lot more than us boys did but either way through mom and dad loving music the sisters singing music we people ask how we got started i don't really know i think we had no choice it was like God put that path there so obviously that we were going to do music. I was four years old when our family recorded the Rempel family gospel cassette in our church. And I have two songs on the album as a four-year-old. So I'd love a copy of that. <laughs> so would I. I'll try and find one. That's Actually, amazing. for Christmas this year, mom and dad burnt the cassette onto CDs and we all got a CD from the 1988 recording session. So I'll, um, I'll be sure to hook you up. I need that. And I'm going to sneak it on as a hidden track <laughs> yeah. on your record. That already happened on our uh, 2003 album. Okay, so it's thank been done. you very much. Right. We, can, we can do it again. Nobody heard that album. So that's all good. <laughs> that's awesome. So three older sisters, three younger brothers. And how did you, well, four-year-old, like, I mean, huh. you've just been around it your whole life. I mean, did you guys start touring when you were that young or when did it actually turn into a the first gig we ever got paid for, I cannot guarantee you what year it was. Let's say roughly it was between 15 and 17 years ago. And it was in Love, Saskatchewan, where the post office says, mail it with love, mm. which is pretty impressive marketing right there. Yeah, yeah. It was about a thousand miles from where we lived. It was our first ever paid gig. So our dad hooked our RV behind our van and pulled it all the way a thousand miles one way. Amazing. Our drummer at the time, uh, Jason Peters, his dad hooked their RV behind their vehicle. So we pulled two RVs, 2,000 miles per round trip. That's 4,000 miles. And they paid us 700 bucks to play the gig. So, <laughs> And one thing I learned about my dad later on in life is he's obviously a very giving individual because somehow after all that fuel, our profit from the show was still 700 bucks. So yeah. it was amazing. That's phenomenal. So you guys have a bit of a, uh, no pun intended, full circle story with yeah. a guy named Ricky Skaggs. Was he kind of, you've told me a little bit of stories about this, but he was a pretty big deal in your house growing up, right? Yeah, you got to understand our mom and dad were Mennonite. We were raised Mennonite, but our mom and dad were raised old school Mennonite, like horse and buggy, no electricity, all that stuff. So in our house, we had a record player. And we even had, for a period of time, a car battery hooked up to a car stereo 8-track player. So there was 8-tracks and records in our house, and I'm not that old. Um, we're talking in the year 2000 is the first time I heard any contemporary music of any sort. And uh, when I came to Nashville in 2007, 
at a writer's retreat. We all had to play our favorite song and say why it had impacted us as a writer. And I played a Diamond Rio song. I'm a huge Diamond Rio fan. I played an album cut called uh, Sawmill Road. Mm. And the next person played Billie Jean. Everybody oohed and awed about how iconic and life-changing this song was. And like an idiot, I raised my hand and said, excuse me, who is that girl singing? <laughs> and that's 2007. That's when I learned who Michael Jackson was. And that's when I heard Billie Jean. So I've been trying to catch up, but quite honestly, since that day till today, we've been quite busy making our own music that I still, earlier, about last month, we heard Stairway to Heaven for the first time while wow. on radio tour. Different DJs would try and find famous songs that we'd never heard. Wow. But one guy we had heard a lot about was Ricky Skaggs. There was basically three records that got played like crazy. It was Skaggs, The Everly Brothers, and Buck Owens. Mm. So mom and dad loved country music so much that they drove all the way to Nashville from Canada for their honeymoon. Later on in life, us kids come along, they introduce us to Ricky Skaggs. We've never heard of Michael Jackson. We've never heard of Led Zeppelin or Aerosmith or you name it, whoever everybody else has heard of. We never heard of any of them. But Ricky Skaggs, in our opinion, and what we were led to believe was the most famous human being on the planet, period, mm -hmm. end of story. Yeah. So we write this song called Make You Mine. Well, I'll rewind a little bit. We get to meet Skaggs through a series of events. I'm a DJ at a little uh, Christian radio station in Northern Canada, and I um, play bluegrass music and positive, family-friendly country music. Mm -hmm. And through that, whenever I go to Nashville, the record labels would give me backstage passes to the Opry because I was a radio DJ. I don't think they ever knew that my station had like seven people listening to it <laughs> or else they probably wouldn't have sucked up to me all the time. Either way, I got to meet Skaggs a few times. He ended up taking our band out on tour. We opened for him in, in four different shows in the Southern US. And I had his email address and we wrote the song with you called Make You Mine. And it was so bluegrassy and so summarized what we grew up on. So I emailed Skaggs and asked him to sing on the track. And about a month went by and there was no response. So my brother Curtis, who plays mandolin, same instrument as Skaggs is famous for, went ahead and emailed Ricky and like one minute later, Skaggs responded and said, sure, I'd love to. <laughs> so <laughs> He has a special connection. <laughs> yeah, he sure does. So he came and uh, played on the record, or sang on the record rather. And as you can imagine for us, there was no human being on earth that would have been a bigger deal for us to have on our record than Ricky Skaggs. And I don't think it's any mistake that that ended up being the song that really launched our career in the US and, and is currently our, our single working up the charts. And it's like all that stuff the full circle moment was probably when we played the Opry and we played Make You Mine at mm. the Opry and Ricky Skaggs comes out and joins us and sings a song, you know, the same place that my mom and dad had driven down to for their honeymoon. Now we're standing yeah. there with this guy on stage. And that was full circle to say the least. Talk about that moment because at least in my mind, that's kind of like maybe an out of body experience. Yeah. I mean, what's going through your head? when you're literally standing on stage and he's singing your second verse. Yeah, I think had I never hung out with him before, I would have been so unbelievably nervous. But because we toured with him a little bit, one time back at the Opry, my wife was expecting our, our second child, Cash, who's now four years old. And Ricky, you know, sees her and she says, Brad, run and grab my wife. And I go and, and find Sharon and I bring her back into his dressing room and and they laid hands on my wife wow. and prayed for her and prayed for this baby that now is a you know very wow. healthy four-year-old child of ours. And all of that stuff had made me have such a respect for Ricky and his family and the way he runs his life and his business. And that when it was time to walk out on stage with him at the Opry, I didn't view it as a, I'm so nervous, I hope I don't screw things up in front of Ricky Skaggs. It was more like, I'm so proud and thrilled and happy and honored and and we just enjoyed it like crazy. And I remember we were telling everybody to listen, you know, on satellite radio to the broadcast. And yeah. it was more of, I hope everybody's listening right now. This is so fun. This is yeah. so exciting. Yeah, that's phenomenal. So you sort of have that full circle moment under your belt. 
Yeah. Can you talk about, because I think your story with just being around Nashville is something that a lot of artists can really learn from just in terms of perseverance and yeah. relationship. We just talked about this today, relationship. How important has relationship been? It's been crazy important. Relationships have been crazy important for me. When my wife and I moved to town, we were in a guest house. We moved here. We came down for four days for a writing trip. And on Craigslist, we started looking for a place to live. We knew we wanted to move here. I was in a publishing deal at the time where I basically wanted to prove to the publishing company that I was for real and I wanted to get a you know, bigger publishing deal, honestly. And um, we get down here and stay in a beautiful extended stay hotel in downtown Nashville. And mm -hmm. on day four, on Craigslist, we find this guest house, just beautiful situation, this huge house um, right by the governor's mansion. And they had five acres. And we had a one-year-old child at the time. And they had this little guest house in the back that we could move into. And it, it worked out so perfect. We ended up staying there for three years. And those three years were very hard. We were very poor, honestly, and I was going to everything. I could find out at 9.30 p.m., hey, there's a show going on, and so-and-so record label person might be there, and I could say, hey, honey, I'm going to quickly go to this thing, and five minutes later, I'd be at the venue. So we did that. We did that a whole lot, and through all that, I met so many people. I mean, I could tell you stories forever of, of different people that connected me with other people, but I remember meeting Jeremy Spielman, I write with Jeremy and he says, you should meet my wife. She's an A&R at Capitol Records. And well, of course I want to meet a lady who's an A&R at Capitol Records. And Melissa Spillman ends up being a great friend and they have me over for dinner. And, and she's like, you're from Canada. You should meet BJ Hill. He's on a hockey team. And BJ's a big shot at Warner Chapel Publishing. And then I'm playing hockey with Alex Heddle at Big Machine and Dave Pakula at Universal at the time. And now at Black River and Krista Stefano, who's wrote a million hit songs. Mm. And I'm just in the hockey dressing room. I'm straight up showering with these dudes, you know, and they're writing massive hit songs. They're signing artists. And yeah. you walk that fine line between not wanting to hand out demos to these guys after the hockey game, but really, really wanting to. Yeah. But that relationship with so many of those guys gave me the courage to walk into any major publishing house or record label in town and say these are just my buddies i can yeah shoot the bull with them about hockey and i think it was a blessing and a curse because i remember ultimately going into their offices to play them songs and never feeling like these guys really respect me as a writer it was more like they think of me as the guy that just played hockey with them last night mm. and our story of how we got the record deal is so weird because it helped like crazy for me to know all these people and perseverance helped like crazy, but it was, it was a weird, weird relationships that, I mean, part of us getting a record deal was a, a dance company called Ultra that heard Make You Mine and thought they should do a remix. But before they did, they decided to call Sony Nashville who calls us for a meeting. And part of it is signing a great management deal with a guy who was friends with some of the same people at Universal as I was. And another part of it was I went in to pitch a song for Keith Urban to my friend Autumn House at Universal. And she paused, it was a song called Every Week's Got a Friday. And in the middle of, after the first chorus, she paused it and said, this isn't for Keith Urban, this is for you. Mm -hmm. And then she heard a song called Young Forever and a song called Make You Mine. And I'll never, ever forget, I still have the voicemail saved on my phone wow. when she said, this changes everything. Mm. And I mean, Curtis was on vacation in Canada at the time. I was down here. And from the moment she said, this changes everything, till about five days later, we had four different record deals in writing. And I was calling my brother. I didn't even call him after the first one because the second one came so fast. And I called him and said, hey, buddy, I don't know what happened, Curtis, but somebody decided that High Valley's cool, and now every record label in town wants to <laughs> sign us. And you start dissecting it now, looking back, and you know that this relationship added to that, and this person's opinion, influenced by our manager calling at the same time, and it's a million moving parts. But did it help to be in Nashville for all those years to just visit Autumn once a month and play her songs for Keith Urban's record or 
or know the guys from Alter Records or, you know, all that stuff did help. And you never know how it's going to help. And I think you have to be very careful to not view your relationships as, hey, how is this relationship going to help me? Because I think if Autumn or Melissa Spillman or anybody had ever thought, oh, Brad's hanging out with me because he's hoping he can get something from me, that probably would have tanked the relationship long before it ever ended up in mm -hmm. any success. And I mean, there were times, let's be honest, where I was hanging out with them definitely to get something. Right. And they're professionals and they know that's how it works. Yeah. That's amazing because that's an art in and of itself. Yeah. Can you talk about, maybe rewind in your mind back to those moments. I was going to say back to the locker room, but that's a little awkward. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. I'll go there. <laughs> rewind back to that season. And how do you know when it's an appropriate time to say, hey, here's my stuff versus like, yeah. what do you think of the game? Or Yeah, know? I think part of a, a blessing and a curse for me is that I'm one of the most straightforward people I've ever met. Yeah, I yeah. would agree with that. Yeah, so. I love that. I do love that sometimes. Often, obviously, it's my personality, so I do choose to have it. But there are definitely people who are a lot better at just chilling and being just... I don't know what it is, but I've only ever cared about three things, honestly. I, I like sports most. I like music probably second most. And I like real estate probably in third place. And mm -hmm. I don't really... I couldn't start playing Pokemon Go and pretend that I cared about it. Right. I just... I have no room in my brain to think about other things. I only think about three things. So when I'm hanging out with somebody, I guess I could talk for 45 minutes about random junk. Or I could just say, hey, man, what do I need to do to get added to the front page of iTunes? Or what do I need to do for you to give me a record deal? Or what do I need to do for you to take us out as the opening act on your tour? At some point, I'm going to ask. So you literally just come straight out and ask those questions. I do. I try to. Mm. I'm not saying I always do. And I'm sure there's been moments when I've been incredibly nervous and the person's been like, eating at Panera Bread with me for an hour, and it's been super obvious that I'm just trying to muster up the courage to ask some question. But I try to cut the crap as much as possible and say, hey, man, how's it going? And I, I genuinely do like talking about how's your kid doing in peewee football, and I can yeah. talk about that for an hour and a half straight. Yeah. But I will still say at some point, like yesterday I was at my publisher, Sony ATV, and we did talk about peewee football for a long time. But at some point, I still said, hey, I really want you guys to hear this new song. And I pressed play and we listened to it. You know, it's like mm -hmm. if I had just left there and talked about Pee Wee football the whole time and drove home to Spring Hill, it wouldn't have been a wasted day, but it would have been a wasted opportunity mm -hmm. to play the song that I thought they needed to hear that yeah. day. Yeah. So I always joke that in High Valley, I'm like, you know, business and Curtis is, you know, actual good times because Curtis and I as a tag team, are great because I could bore you to death with analytics and digital marketing and stuff that I care about. And Curtis could say one hilarious thing and yeah. whoever we're meeting could love High Valley for the rest of their life. And I guarantee you it wasn't because I bored the crap out of them with all my yeah. marketing stuff. Yeah. But since Curtis made them love High Valley, I can now call them up next week and say, hey, remember when I asked you about this? Could we, sure. how do we make this happen? Yeah, so it's a powerful little tag team effort, but yeah. th there still is an art, though. I mean, it's this is one of those things that a lot of people, I don't know, it's just the word networking that, like, yeah. I hate that word, <laughs> Yeah, and most people will probably hate that word, yeah. and the people that love that word maybe are like the annoying networkers. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, I, I think there's a really disgusting stigma that comes with networking, yeah. and if you go somewhere to do networking... yeah. Yeah, I hate that. I really hate that. I hate slow moving operations. I'm a very, I'm probably the most impatient person around. I mean, my yeah. wife will guarantee you that's true. <laughs> but if I think there's a chance that somebody could hear Make You Mine and decide that it should get played on the radio, I would hate to wait until tomorrow for that person to hear that song. Mm -hmm. Sometimes if we're driving to the gym and it's only a 10 minute drive from our house and I'm driving, I'll put it in park and say, hey, honey, can you drive? Because I got it. And I have a thought and I need to email 10 different people about the same thing. And honestly, this town runs on a lot of hype. And 
that's part of how a lot of things have been accomplished in my life too, is if you can get everybody in town talking about the same thing. And I'm not even talking about people that you need to get on your team. I'm talking about people that already are mm -hmm. on your team. So I have a great booking agent, great manager, great publisher, great record label, great producer, mm -hmm. wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> and Go on. Uh, yeah, <laughs> do tell. <laughs> but I will often, if, if we have a good show in Orlando, which just happened the other day, we had a great experience in Orlando, Florida. I could have said, wow, what a great experience. But before I was even back at the hotel, I'd already called the president of the label and the head of radio and our booking agent and our management and made sure everybody woke up, you know, on Tuesday morning and called whoever they knew in Orlando to make sure we either got played more or got booked more or mm. something happened to keep the fire rocking. You know, it's like, I feel like everybody needs that encouragement. I know I do. Yeah. And the old farm term, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. I never like to go silent for too long and just let people wonder what's going on with High Valley. I need yeah. to let people know. So I like everybody to know at the same time. I like them to know instantly. And part of that is maybe our culture with social media where people expect to know things instantly. But I like to fire people up and have everybody know what's positive. And I think I am overly optimistic most of the time. But I also think that helps. If you're going to expect things to not work in the music industry, they're already probably not going to. So yeah. if you go in there with an attitude thinking that they're not going to, it's going to really suck. That's, that's just a pretty good life principle in general. Yeah. If you go into a situation thinking something is not going to work, chances are it's probably not going to work. Exactly. And if you look at where we're from, 2,500 miles north of Nashville, you know, we're driving ice road to get to our town. Didn't have internet. You know, we had dial up internet the last year of being a teenager. I mean, yeah. we had no chance on earth of getting a record deal in Nashville. Mm -hmm. I drove down here in a Jeep Grand Cherokee with an Atlas before I had a cell phone. <laughs> and we ran out of gas in North Dakota and coasted downhill and literally got close enough to the gas station where we could stretch the gas hose far enough to just get a little <laughs> bit in there. And I was 18 years old at the time. And I mean, 2,500 miles one way is a long way to drive to try and make something work. But I always tell people if it's in like an autograph line or something, parents come up with their kids and say, do you have any advice for my daughter? She'd like to maybe be a musician. I always say, tell your daughter if she likes music, she should give up. If she loves music, she should still give up. If she is <laughs> literally so obsessed with music that it almost hurts, then she should probably consider it. Wow. And that sounds a little harsh and once again, very straightforward. It's what people need to hear though. But I cannot imagine just loving music and having stuck it out for 20 years. If, yeah. if all I did was just love it a lot, I don't think that's nearly enough. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's good, man. We'll talk about radio because I'm going back in my mind of trying to picture Brad Rempel being a radio DJ. <laughs> yeah. First of all, what does that mean? Like, well, <laughs> I want to hear these shows. <laughs> you, I don't know if you do. But that has to play into like, because, I mean, you guys have been going nuts in terms of just touring and yeah. hitting every radio station in the country. I mean, there has to be some part of you that that goes through your mind of like, you're actually probably able to relate with radio people more than a lot of artists ever will. I mean, at the beginning I was because some of the technology was the same as what I had been using, you know, the little programs you use for running your show. But now, I mean, I'm, I haven't done it for so many years that I'm way outdated and way behind the times. But I do tell most DJs we hang out with that my dream in life was to be them, you know. I mean, it was <laughs> High Valley. The name High Valley came from... We didn't have any radio in our town. We had an AM station from 200 miles away that was called CKYL, but we called it Squeaky YL <laughs> because it was so squeaky you could hardly hear it, unless it was cold <laughs> enough, which thankfully in the winter happened yeah. quite often. But it would be like the price of wheat and the price of canola, and every once in a while there'd be a country song. Mm. And so since we didn't have radio, my mom and dad bought me a cassette recorder as a kid, and I would record the news, weather, sports, I'd be the DJ, I'd sing the song. The song was usually Pretty Woman, which I have no idea how I knew that song, but mm. I would sing it. And the band was always called High Valley. And I was a little kid just faking this entire radio show. I did commercials yeah. and everything. So when we finally played our first show as a band, 
It was called the Eagle's Nest Bible Camp Gospel Jamboree. Awesome. And we play a song called Fishing. <laughs> fishing, I want to go fishing, be a fisher of men for you. And great, great that, was the, that was a hook right there. And we play it. We get, you know, a big old encore. They ask for another song. We don't have another song. So we play fishing again, <laughs> except we all forgot the chords and it was horrendous. <laughs> but the MC after says, that was great, boys. Do you have a name for your band? And we're all like sheepishly, these tiny little kids looking at our shoes. We, you know, you don't yeah. have a name for your band. You're just playing guitar. And, and when a, our guitar player's mom yells out, yeah, they're called High Valley. And the guy's like, "High Valley, everybody!" And that was that was it. So you somehow just ran with it. Somehow this fake radio show I did created our band name, <laughs> and it's just always been that way. But I'd do like Jesus Take the Wheel, Live Like You Were Dying, Positive Country, and a lot of bluegrass stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was a DJ. I mean, it was just once a week for an hour. It was a little show called The Middle of Nowhere, which was a Dan Tominsky song. Yeah. And you'd hear Dan Tominsky's beautiful voice singing, stuck in the middle of nowhere. And then, hey, this is Brad Rempel, and you're in the middle of nowhere. And I was literally in the middle of nowhere in an Indian reservation in Fort Vermilion, Alberta, up, you know, way too close to the North Pole. And a little trailer that my mentor, Michael Sandstrom, had donated to this Christian radio station. And I had a lot of friends that hated country music and thought it was all about tears and beers and fighting and leaving and... I guess I had this chip on my shoulder to prove that there was really encouraging mm. country music out there. So I created this show and basically I would just find songs. Some of them were easy to find, like Jesus Take the Wheel, but I'd find stuff out there that was really encouraging and exciting and sounded great. And that was my radio show. So Dan's song was literally like the bumper song for your exactly. thing? Exactly. Yeah. Which is hilarious because people listening out there, we just got to write with Dan Tomiski today. Which was amazing. And I just think so many times life is just such a, at least it's been this way for me and it sounds like for you, life has been this just giant series of these crazy full circle moments of definitely like how in the world am I in where I am now? Yeah, like, how is just like Dan just texted me and said, hey, you know, this was great. Yeah. How is Dan Tominsky texting me when I would have given, you know, my left arm to hang out with the guy, right? And now yeah. here he was in your house and we're writing a killer song and I don't know. I always tell my boys every day when I drop Drew off for school, he's in second grade, I always say, be respectful and be thankful. And mm -hmm. those are the only two things I ever tell them to do. Unfortunately, there's a lot of things I tell them not to do, but those are the two <laughs> things I tell them to do. And I feel like I'm trying right now very hard to be respectful when we're put in positions where maybe we are the headliner and, and we can start thinking we're so cool and we deserve, you know, people better have the right towels and the right stuff in our green room and we better have, you know, a clean bus and all this stuff. You can start feeling really entitled really quickly when people mm. try to do so many good things for you. So being respectful is incredibly important. And I think being thankful goes hand in hand with that. Like, yeah. if I can remember, holy, I just wrote with Dan Tominsky. I'm so thankful, God, for this life I have. What a dream come true. The chances of me being respectful next time we have a junky, you know, festival we're playing at where we're not being treated good and they don't have the budget to do fancy, nice things for us. I can be respectful and thankful that we're just doing music, period. I mean, right. you're in a bus one day being treated like a king and the next day you're literally at a old county fair sitting in a minivan backstage with dust blowing in and, you know, trying to get some air conditioning because there's nowhere else to hang out. And yeah. That's, I think, life of a musician. It'll go up and down like crazy. And we're just trying to remain thankful and respectful through yeah. through it all. So talk about the record deal a little bit, because you guys are signed to Warner Music yeah. in Nashville. A lot of artists say when they sign the deal, it's like almost starting all over again. Has that kind of been your experience of it a little bit too? I think that's where being thankful for how long it took us to get here really came into play. Had we signed with Warner when I first got to town, I'm quite sure it would have been like starting from scratch, learning what they want, doing everything they want, trying to learn how to write a song. But instead, we were able to have... Curtis and I had been independent for about a year and a half. We were in between record deals, in between managers. And 
we had done everything as a two-man operation. I remember we went to Boots and Hearts, which is the biggest music festival in Canada. We were on the main stage. We were playing late at night, like a couple acts before Tim McGraw. And we had no sound guy, no road manager, no manager. We had a suitcase with two direct boxes in it. Mm. The front of house from the festival was doing our sound. We were just a lean, mean machine. But we figured out a way to make it work. So by the time we signed with Warner, they said, man, we love your fan club. Can you guys keep doing that? And we love your producer. We love your production style. We love your, we love these songs. We don't want you to even re-record them. When they told us the first single was going to be Make You Mine, which already existed and we didn't need to touch it, that was such a good sign for me. Is you know, Had they said, hey, we love what you do. Now let's try and change it all. And maybe we can find a radio single. That would have been a different beast altogether. But this was, hey, we like this actual song you already have. Keep doing what you're doing. That was, in my opinion, a product of how many years we've been doing it. We actually discovered who we really were, who we wanted to be, who we wanted people to think of us as. What was natural? Make Your Mind was the most real, natural, organic-sounding, high-valley thing we'd ever done. Mm. So... Signing with Warner Nashville wasn't like starting all over again at all, except for the fact that in Canada, we were on our 16th single at Country Radio. Wow. And this was our first in the U.S. Yeah. So I've been answering for the last nine months quite a few times, oh, it feels so cool. It's so amazing when people ask us in the U.S., what was it like to hear your song on the radio for the first time? (laughs) And the truth is, it was very exciting because it was in the U.S. for the first time. Mm. But you try not to get involved in all the details of, well, sir, I've actually heard it a million times in Canada. Because Mm. the truth is, the U.S. is 10 times bigger. It's 10 times as many people. And are we thrilled with the success in Canada? Yes, it blows our minds and exceeds all the expectations and dreams we ever had. But... We never started our band as a four-year-old, you know, standing on a footstool in our basement trying to entertain my sisters. My goal wasn't to be the best country band in Canada. I never thought of countries or any physical boundaries to music. I I never even thought when I listened to a Ricky Skaggs record, I wonder how big he is in New Zealand or Portugal or U.S. or Canada. I just thought, I love this song. So when we started making music and it got popular in one country, that was amazing. Now that it's working in a different country, that's even more amazing. I mean, we'll yeah. we'll go to any country that'll have us. We just played in the UK, and they were probably the most well-educated High Valley fans I've ever met. They knew more about our back catalog. Wow. They were singing along to songs that nobody should have ever heard, but they must have gone on YouTube and found acoustic live performance video and stuff. And I guess they were so thirsty for country music out there that they did a buttload of research and just knew everything about us before we ever landed. Well, talk about your fans a little bit, because this is another thing that ever since I've gotten to know you, and I love what you said earlier about it's really not a good idea to go silent for too long. Yeah. You guys totally embrace this with your fans. And I think this, from my perspective, has been one of the ways that you guys have been able to win. Yeah, it definitely has. And Our fans, honestly, during that period of time I mentioned where we were between record deals and between managers, when you don't have a record deal, you don't have an A&R team, you don't have anybody telling you, this song is good, this song's worse, this song's better. So we literally uploaded, I want to say 50 demos to our fan club site and just for streaming. At the time, I want to say we had 2,000 fan club members. And they voted on their favorite songs. And Make You Mine, County Line, and She's With Me were their three favorite songs. Those also ended up being our three career-defining songs in Canada. And so far, Make You Mine has been our career kickoff here in the U.S. So just having 2,000 people being able to unanimously point at a certain song gave us so much confidence to release it to radio, to really hedge our bets on it and say, this is, this is the one, you know? So we learned from that experience that we never want to like shy away from our fans, given them, we've got fans who have been with us backstage at so many shows. We had a fan from our fan club, Glenn Page, who came, we were shooting a little acoustic video at the farmhouse and he drove in from Pennsylvania. Mm. He asked us if he could, we said, of course. 
come on down because our fans knew we were doing this event. Therefore, they had the opportunity to express interest in coming down. And there he was hanging out with us behind the scenes of a, you know, 20 person film crew hanging out on a farm in Columbia, Tennessee. And mm. some people might not give their fans that kind of behind the scenes access, but we think, A, wow, we have fans, this is cool. <laughs> mm. And B, they're willing to drive around the country to just hang out with us. Why? Why not give them those experiences? So we've had fans at video shoots. We've had fans at the Opry when we played Make You Mine. We've got some killer fans in our fan club that we call the board of directors that we fly down to Nashville once a year just to take them to the best Mexican restaurants and best barbecue restaurants in town and, and show them your studio and show them what a normal day is for High Valley. And yeah. we don't plan on backing off from the daily engagement with our fans anytime soon because we're still borderline shocked that they would want to be that engaged and just kind of mm -hmm. flattered by it. So two things, how does a fan become a part of your fan club and how can an artist, you know, take what you're doing? Because I think every artist could literally just be taking notes right now of like, this is how we serve our fans. Yeah. Well, the easiest way to become a fan club member is just go to highvalleymusic.com and uh, click on fan club, or you can download our app, which is High Valley Official on the App Store. And ultimately, the app and the fan club work simultaneously. Almost, you know, every other day on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat will give you something that you can go see in our fan club. So there's always links and ways to wind up in our fan club we just finished a, a guitar giveaway contest with fender where we gave away this amazing fender a nashville telecaster mm. and that was all through our fan club and yeah it's cool to see big companies like that being willing to throw us a free guitar to give to our fan club because they know we've got enough people you know over there totally to pay attention and i can't remember what your question was now it was how to, no, be, no, how no, to was, check out the fan so club. so check out the fan club second thing is since getting to know you, you've kind of been developing this in a partnership with another company as well, too. Yeah. But obviously you guys have, it has to be a band that's willing to do the work for a yeah. thing like this to work. Yeah. So you're asking like, how would a band yeah. kind of emulate the, yeah. there's a company called Fancy. You can check out fan.si. So it's not .com, it's .si, Fancy. And that's who, you know, our good buddies, Matt Grieve and Joel Oje are over there. And Joel's a, a brainiac. Matt's like maybe the best networker in the world. Actually, for sure, the best yeah. networker that I've ever met. And those guys are who set us up with the back end, you know, the product that we use. But I would highly encourage any band to check it out. And like almost anything, it's only going to work if you make it work. So. Mm -hmm. I don't think a manager works if you don't help the manager work. I don't even think a record label works if you don't help them work. I literally don't think anything is missing from any artist's career that is going to solve their problems yeah. more than them doing more mm -hmm. for themselves. I'm busier now with a manager and a road manager and a business manager than I was without the three. Mm -hmm. Not because they're not doing incredible work, but because they're creating so much stuff that yeah. me just saying the words yes and no to different questions is more than what I used to do, you know, mm -hmm. with my life. So I think if you're going to do it, you have to sign on to say, we're going to give the fans a lot of content. I'm not saying we're perfect at it. We have definitely failed quite often at going silent for too long. But as long as you have a, you're willing to allow fans in, you can't be too precious with information. You know, people used to say, I wrote this song, but I don't want anybody to hear it because I want to keep it for myself as if people are running around stealing other people's songs. You know, that's yeah. like the least of our worries. Right. But you can't be precious with your information. You can't be, you know, there's private. I don't post, my kids' faces are literally never on the internet. Mm -hmm. You'll find, you know, every once in a while, the back of my kid's football helmet, if you're lucky, mm -hmm. on the internet. But I don't, want, I don't want any random Joe Blow to know private stuff about my family. But if I'm going to work, I call the studio, songwriting, recording, touring, that's work. That's totally mm -hmm. different. And if I can go to Home Depot and I'm allowed to hang out with a guy and he can tell me what he knows about how to put down a hardwood floor, 
then a fan should be able to go to the studio with me and I can tell them what I know about laying down a vocal or writing a song or yeah. I don't see how it should be any different. So thankfully technology allows us to bring the fans backstage with all this stuff. And for the hardcore fans that want to do it, it costs money, but they join our board of directors and instead of just being there for videos, they physically get flown into Nashville and and hang out with us and we show them, you know, in real life what's up. And that the board of directors idea was I was thinking of myself as a kid and how much I would have killed for the opportunity to pay somebody to let me fly to Nashville and see what is a weekend like for, for an artist. I want to learn. I want to know about this stuff. So that's why we created it. Mm -hmm. Honestly, we don't make any money off it. We spend, we probably lose money because we try and treat them really good when they're yeah. in Nashville. But it's an opportunity for people who care about the music industry to actually feel like, kind of like they are our record label. They mm -hmm. are our sounding board. We Curtis designs a shirt and they say, that shirt's awesome or that shirt sucks. Mm -hmm. And we like having those people there to help us make those decisions. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. Well, Brad, I know you're probably off to some special fan club event as we speak. <laughs> or Pee Wee football. Or Pee Wee football. Yeah. So, yeah. man, thank you so much for taking the time. I know you guys are slammed. Your single's climbing up the charts. You guys are touring like crazy. So this was definitely a treat for us and our listeners are going to get a lot out of it. Thank you so much for having me. This was great, for real. Hi, this is Seth Mosley, and you've been listening to the Full Circle Music Show, the why of the music biz. If you haven't already, text in produce, P-R-O-D-U-C-E, to 44222, and we will send you information on the Music Production Mastery course, as well as some free tips to your email inbox. If you haven't already done so, head over to iTunes and leave us a good rating, good five-star review. That helps us more than you know. This show is produced by the Full Circle Music Show with editing help from Jericho Scroggins, Kaylee Ingram, and Asa Wiggins. We will see you back here next week.